Good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our Amphori webinar uh, about um, that where we will be sharing insights from the uh, 2023 gender benchmark. I'm very grateful that you uh, can make the time for joining us on this very special occasion today. Uh, as you know, we are the 8th of March. It's an important celebration date, and uh, we will be celebrating it by um, learning more about uh, the um, issues surrounding uh, gender and gender inequality uh, in uh, global supply chains. Um, we have one hour to spend together and, and we are aiming for this hour to be as informative and interactive as possible. So we will start with a presentation from Linda and Forrest president. Uh, she will be um, giving the introduction. Uh, and then we have a very special guest with us, Namit, who is uh, is joining us from the World Benchmarking Alliance. And he will uh, feed you with insights from the 2023 gender benchmark. And uh, of course, because I said that we wanted to have this session being as interactive as possible, we have factored in some time for questions and answers. Uh, to do that, you can uh, enter your questions. Uh, you don't have to wait until the moment of the question and answers to put your questions in uh, the Q&A. At the bottom of your screen, you would say, we'll see a little Q&A. You enter your question there. I will uh, then uh, read them out to, to Namit uh, when the time comes. Uh, so do not hesitate. You don't have to wait. So. Please, uh, we want to uh, be able to answer as many questions as possible, and then we will uh, conclude the day. So uh, as you would have noticed, you are all muted. This is to avoid um, as much as possible disruption so that we can spend uh, time together being uh, fully uh, focused on what will be shared. Um, and so, uh, but you, can still participate either through the chat or through sending uh, questions. So without further ado, I will give the floor to uh, Linda Komyong, I'm sorry, President, uh, who will give the introductory words uh, from today's webinar. Thank you very much, uh, Cathy, and indeed warm welcome to all uh, on this important topic. Um, it's important we have International Women's Day because there is still a lot that we can do better on this topic. And there's still a lot we can do better in tackling gender inequality in supply chains. And let me now move to, the, really I would say the question, is there room to celebrate today or not? And I think probably it is a bit of a mixed bag. Um, no, there's no room, I would say, to celebrate today if you look at the gender pay gap and that it will still take us, you know, based on the latest report, 131 years to close the gap. And that's too long, and that's why we need a push. But we also see that women's rights and human rights, which I think is a, is a really a big win that that was really understood, but we also know equally that women are more vulnerable. And they are more vulnerable toward violence, vulnerable to harassment in many different ways and forms, more vulnerable to discrimination. So there is really the need to pay specific attention to vulnerable groups, and that does include women. If we look into women in leadership, I think there's good news, but there's also still things to wish for. Say globally, yes, we see that women are moving up and that there is around 30% of leadership position is being held with women. We also know there's big difference between the industry, but also the difference in levels within companies. And we also know that in manufacturing, it is really still quite low, but it's still a very male dominated, I would say, environment. If we look into supply chain and specifically women in supply chain, yes, the global supply chain, I would say the globalization has helped women in the sense that they have been given access to jobs that they didn't have before. It has lifted many of them out of poverty, being able to uh, send their kids to uh, education, uh, provide for food and shelter, contribute to the family, say income here. So that's good news. But we also know that very often women hold, say, the uh, uh, lower positions within, uh, within factories, within supply chains, and therefore are more vulnerable. So yes, there's something to celebrate, and yes, we should be positive, but there's also a lot of more things that we can do better. 
how do we do that? How do we tackle that one? That's not easy. And it does, there's not one solution. It's a multiple, uh, I would say multifaceted. We need a lot of solutions in there. And it does require a very proactive approach. And there is steps to be taken if we really want to focus on supply chain and gender inequality there. And it always starts with data. And that's also where Namit will talk about in say the benchmarking there that's based on data. So you need to understand, you know, what is the impact on men and women? How does it differ? And, and where are the highest risk? And based on that one, and this is really just common sense, you will need to develop policies, responses that take into account the specifics of gender, about how to address those, how to talk about those, how to mitigate issues, how to remediate if, uh, if and when needed. And it also then means that you will need to embed that in responsible purchasing practices, but putting it on paper is one thing. It's even more important that you educate your procurement and sourcing team, but also the suppliers about what does that mean and why it is relevant. And of course, in looking into diligence and assessing your suppliers, do that also through a specific gender lens, because uh, that's relevant in the sense that uh, they are more vulnerable. There's other signals maybe to look out for than maybe for other uh, parameters here. So looking through this gender lens is really required for robust due diligence. If we then move to the next slide. So what is it that FORI does? Um, well, you are, Probably very much aware about our Amphoria BSCI Code of Conduct, eh? Amphoria Business Social Compliance Initiative. And as part of the principles in our Code of Conduct, we say there's no gender-based discrimination, also no precarious employment, eh? no, uh, no discrimination, uh, uh, equal rights uh, uh, for everyone. And what we did in the last uh, BSCI Code of Conduct revision, we did look into that revision through a gender lens to really make sure that the wording we use, uh, the uh, signals we are looking after are being included in the right way. We will continue doing that if and when we develop new products or update our products, because this gender lens is not a one-off thing. We should apply this always and ever. Then we have our On4 We Speak for Change program. And that is you know, giving a voice if something goes wrong, uh, and it doesn't work, we say the local grievance mechanism, this is an opportunity to raise the voice. And that follows, of course, your guiding principles and the criteria that in there that that would say um, uh, that, that really would uh, uh, define what good grievance mechanism look like. And that focuses very much also on, you know, heightened risk, as already said, about vulnerable women and about marginalizing those. And that's really an important element of the program. And last but not least, it's also about Amphoric collaboration. This topic, I already started with, it takes one of the 31 years to close the gap. We can't solve it if we don't collaborate. And that's within Amphoric's DNA. So we collaborate with many organizations that put women and diversity at the forefront, like UNIS, Women Win, UN Women, ILO, but also Women Empowerment Principles, just to name a few because we can't do this alone. It takes all of us to drive sustainable change and make an impact. If we can go to the next last slide. Uh, when women are at the table, let me read it here. The discussion is richer, the decision making process is better, and the organization is stronger. So that is a business case. Today's or this year's team of International Women's Day is about inspire inclusion, and inclusion also means, just to state the obvious, that we find joint solution. 50% of the world population are women, 50% of the world population are men. We need to do it together because otherwise we're not going to make the impact that we need to have. So we also need to have conversations together and not only among women or only among men, but jointly here. I think that's also an important element of inclusion. Let me now hand over uh, to the World Benchmarking Alliance and Amit, because I already said data is important. That's where it starts, understand your data, but peer pressure also helps. And Amit, over to you. Thanks so much, uh, Linda, and uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone, depending on where you're joining from. Uh, 
My name is Namit. Uh, I work as the Social Transformation Lead uh, for the World Benchmarking Alliance, uh, where we produce benchmarks at the intersection of uh, SDGs and uh, responsible business. Uh, and our benchmarks are free and publicly available. And I would like to thank um, for you to uh, give us this opportunity to present findings from our 2023 gender benchmark, uh, which uh, sits in the social uh, transformation, which you will see at the center of this graphic on, on your screen. Uh, uh, let me first also tell you about uh, World Benchmarking Alliance and, and who we are and what we do. So. WBA is a global nonprofit organization um, which develops uh, benchmarks on, on various topics. Uh, and we are an alliance. And like uh, Linda, you mentioned, uh, it's, it's a challenge uh, that we can't solve alone. So we need to work with others, collaborate with others. Uh, we are an alliance of 400 uh, organizations from all over the world, from different uh, stakeholder groups uh, who are trying to address many of these issues which are identified in the Sustainable Development Goals uh, as a framework to use. Uh, and um, we have identified these seven system transformations. And we believe that if we have to deliver successfully on the SDGs, um, we need to achieve these seven transformations. And businesses have a very important role to play in addressing uh, these seven transformations. And in the social transformation, we try to translate the principle of leave no one behind, uh, which is very much central to the SDGs framework. Uh, and, and with that, we also look at uh, two specific uh, issues much more in depth uh, with our gender benchmark, but also with our corporate human rights benchmark, which focuses on human rights uh, issues. So, so that in a nutshell is what uh, WBA is and, and what we do and where we are coming from. <clears throat> Before we go into the gender benchmark, I also wanted to share a little bit about uh, how do we do the benchmarking cycle. And our benchmarks are designed based on the information that companies publicly disclose uh, in their sustainability reports, in their annual reports. Uh, in various other filings uh, that are publicly available. Uh, we let companies know uh, that we are going to assess them. Many companies also participate in the methodology development process uh, so that the methodologies uh, become a roadmap of sorts, also help and guide companies in their own implementation on various uh, issues. Uh, we collect this data, we share this data with companies uh, asking for their feedback and inputs, after which we do the analysis and publish uh, Benchmark, and this is a standard benchmarking cycle across all the benchmarks that WBA produces. Coming to the gender benchmark, uh, we have assessed uh, 1,006 companies, uh, but we rounded off and say a thousand companies uh, to, to be uh, uh, easy. Uh, and uh, we have also done an in-depth assessment of 112 companies. Uh, in the apparel sector, as well as the food and agriculture sector. Uh, so the overall methodology looks at uh, workplace related issues, supply chain related issues, uh, uh, which is uh, applied fully on these two sectors, apparel and food. But we looked at um, more of the core gender issues, a subset of the overall methodology across these thousand companies, uh, which, which are from 10 different industry sectors. Uh, and our ambition is to apply the methodology to all 2,000 companies in, in the next couple of years uh, to see what are the main trends that we can find from uh, these companies. Our objective of the benchmark uh, is to identify what's working well, what are companies doing better on the gender benchmark uh, so that other companies can learn from it, other stakeholders can learn from it, and where are those gaps. Uh, and there are certainly uh, gaps which are more systemic in nature, and how can other stakeholders, including governments, uh, investors, uh, civil society organizations, can also play a part in addressing some of those systemic challenges. So, so that is where the gender benchmark is located, and that's where we are coming from. <clears throat> so these 1,000 companies are spread all over the world. Most of the companies are located in these three regions, so East Asia, Europe, and North America. Companies come from 10 different industry sectors, uh, employing over 50 million people. 
and a cumulative turnover of uh, 24 trillion US dollars. You can go to the next slide. This is a snapshot of uh, the gender benchmark methodology. We have six different uh, measurement areas across which we measure policy commitment and performance of companies, uh, starting from governance and strategy, trying to see what are uh, the existing mechanisms and systems in place? What is the vision and direction of the coming uh, company coming from the very top, uh, which is setting the tone of what the company is going to do? Uh, then we look at issues around the representation, compensation and benefits, health and well-being, violence and harassment uh, at the workplace, as well as the supply chain to look at, is there a difference between companies' application of many of these policy commitments in the workplace and in the supply chain. And if there is a gap, uh, then trying to identify what are the ways and means in uh, nudging companies, encouraging companies, helping companies to be able to take that extra step and also focus on the supply chain uh, issues. Uh, and then we look at marketplace and community, uh, more from uh, the gender norms perspective. Companies have a very important role uh, through the product service uh, and the communications to also influence some of the societal norms that exist uh, and, and their ability to influence uh, behavior of people who are generally associated with companies uh, in, in uh, the overall uh, ecosystem. So, so that's on the methodology um, and we can go to the findings now. So I think um, quite aligned with what uh, Linda, you presented uh, that we have a long way to go uh, to look at uh, gender equality, women's empowerment uh, overall when it comes to uh, the economic space. In our assessment, uh, we also found that uh, the road to uh, gender equality is very long. Uh, uh, the average score for the 1,000 companies was just 17% uh, across all the indicators uh, that we have. Uh, and in fact, 12% of the companies uh, scored zero on all indicators. Uh, uh, th this also means that uh, this is based on disclosures. Uh, and there might be companies who are doing certain things, but they are not uh, disclosing that in the public domain. And for us, we believe that transparency is very important uh, for all sustainability issues uh, so that all stakeholders can actually see what companies are doing, what are their commitments, what are their performance. And if there are gaps, uh, companies can be held accountable uh, by uh, the different stakeholders. So, so that's where we are coming from. And that transparency is very much a core of uh, what we are trying to uh, do when engaging with uh, companies. We also found that uh, women are generally underrepresented and their concerns are unheard in most companies. Uh, we found that only three companies have achieved uh, gender balance across all leadership levels. Uh, and we define gender balance as uh, 40 to 60%. Uh, um, and, and that's a range uh, within which uh, we, we assess whether companies have uh, that level of gender balance across all of their leadership levels, starting from the entry level, going all the way up to the executive and the board. Uh, and uh, only 3% of the companies that we assess uh, have employee surveys or other mechanisms uh, using which they engage their employees on specific issues around gender equality. So this shows that many of the concerns that women might have uh, remain unheard because those mechanisms don't exist uh, in almost all the companies that we assessed. Thank you. Thank you. What we also wanted to do is uh, measure and see what are the top 100 companies doing uh, that the remaining 900 companies uh, are not doing. And, and this is very important for us to identify some of the good practice and use it as an example to influence uh, and engage other companies uh, so that some of the good practices can be scaled up uh, by other companies as well. And what we found is the top companies uh, who are outperforming the rest uh, are doing so by making a public commitment to gender equality and addressing the issue of uh, unpaid care. And I think uh, there's a lot of literature available now which suggests that uh, the burden of unpaid care on women is, is uh, very large uh, and still is very much not acknowledged uh, 
So I think that is very important uh, for companies uh, to take that step and acknowledge and make sure uh, some of these challenges are also addressed. So, so we found that uh, companies, 73% uh, of the companies have made a public commitment to gender equality. And comparing that with the remaining 900, only 20% of the 900 companies have made a similar public commitment. Uh, similarly, 59% of the top companies provide childcare and family support, uh, trying to address the unpaid care burden uh, on women. Whereas uh, only 20% of the bottom 900 companies uh, have similar uh, provisions. And uh, flexible work is also quite important. Uh, and we found that 75% of the top 100 companies provide opportunities of flexible work uh, to their employees. <clears throat> Uh, we also wanted to see um, where companies are and where sectors in general are when it comes to various measurement areas uh, of the benchmark. Uh, and we found that apparel companies uh, and, and pharmaceutical companies have the highest average scores uh, and uh, food and beverage companies uh, and agricultural product companies have uh, the lowest average scores uh, overall. Uh, but it's also important to note that even the highest scoring companies uh, do not score beyond 50%. So there is still a lot of room for those companies to also cover, but uh, we just wanted to look at some of the trends across uh, industry sectors. Looking at um, parental leave uh, linked to my comment on unpaid care work, uh, we, we found that uh, companies treat parental leave as a benefit uh, offered to some employees. Uh, but not as a right which can be enjoyed by all uh, employees, irrespective of where they are located. Uh, and only 36% of the 1,000 companies uh, disclose a maternity leave policy. Uh, a similar percentage disclose a paternity leave policy. But in most cases, uh, these policies do not apply globally to all employees. So while some of the policies apply to uh, a certain headquarter or a certain location, but other regions uh, and employees in other regions do not necessarily uh, enjoy the benefit of uh, some of these uh, policies. Uh, and ILO, uh, which is the International Labor Organization, prescribes a minimum of 14 weeks of maternity leave. Uh, and we found that only 7% of the companies are meeting uh, this standard. Uh, and when we took a deep dive uh, to look at what companies are doing in the supply chain, we found that none of the companies actually require their suppliers to provide parental leave, uh, which was quite a big uh, uh, surprise for us, uh, looking at the issues and the challenges that uh, supply chains have been facing in many cases, particularly in apparel and food. A lot of the people working in factories, in farms uh, are, are women um, as well. So, so that was something that's quite surprising that we found. On uh, the issue of violence and harassment, uh, we find that um, companies generally uh, talk about prohibiting violence and harassment uh, publicly, but when it comes to taking concrete steps to preventing uh, violence or remediating um, some of those impacts, uh, there are very few companies who are actually taking uh, steps and talking publicly about that. Uh, over 60% of the companies uh, have a policy that prohibits uh, violence and harassment at work. Uh, and uh, it, it's also true in the supply chain where a lot of companies uh, uh, have uh, supplier commitments to follow the same policies. Uh, but when it comes to remediation process uh, and providing support to uh, people who might bring up some of those issues, uh, less than 5% of the companies actually have a clear remediation process or providing support to um, whistleblowers or people who bring in some of these grievances forward. The last key finding uh, is specifically on the apparel sector, uh, and I'm not sure how many of you uh, are from the apparel sector, but what we have noticed is uh, there is a lot of expectation and awareness uh, from companies uh, on what suppliers should be doing to promote uh, gender equality. Uh, but when it comes to taking concrete steps and providing an ecosystem and support, uh, to their suppliers. We did not find enough examples of how companies are doing that. Uh, so, I mean, almost 90% of the companies have at least one requirement related to 
gender equality in their contractual agreements or code of conduct uh, with suppliers. Uh, but only 27% uh, enable their suppliers to meet these expectations through responsible purchasing practices. Uh, um, and, and which was something also highlighted uh, in, in the presentation that Linda made. Uh, <clears throat> there is enough transparency of the supply chain now, at least in the apparel sector where companies uh, are talking about uh, their suppliers, some of the issues that they face, uh, but it is not necessarily informed by the challenges that workers face, uh, the challenges that are existing in some of those factories and supply chains. Uh, and, and that kind of makes it um, uh, impossible to address some of those real issues on the ground uh, if those uh, enabling ecosystems don't exist uh, for suppliers to be able to meet those uh, expectations. So that definitely is a big gap uh, that we are asking companies to take uh, immediate steps on uh, so that it doesn't remain on paper that uh, companies are expecting suppliers to be more um, gender uh, responsive but there are actual uh, systems in place to address that. So conscious of time, I don't know how much time do I have, but probably I'll go a bit faster uh, on, on these. Uh, and um, uh, I'll talk about the gender balance representation because I think representation is definitely a key issue when it comes to uh, gender equality. And we find that um, uh, Companies uh, definitely have uh, um, a higher uh, representation uh, in, in the board level, but even that is way below the expected uh, uh, ex expected uh, level of 40 to 60 percent. Uh, and there are varying degrees of uh, representation there, particularly in senior management and senior executive level. Uh, there is definitely a drop in the representation um, that we see. Uh, and, and I think. Uh, this kind of shows uh, the picture that uh, a lot of ground needs to be covered, even in some of these leading companies uh, of the world when it comes to providing a much more balanced representation uh, here. And we found that only three companies uh, of uh, the apparel sector that we assessed uh, are actually collecting sex uh, disaggregated data by leadership level across their supply chain. And, and it's very important for companies to collect sex disaggregated data to be able to take informed decisions on addressing some of those uh, gaps and plugging uh, these representation imbalances. You can go to the next slide. <clears throat> Similarly, in the food and ag sector, um, what we found is almost half of the companies uh, have a public commitment to gender equality. Um, and, and a lot of companies have gender targets in their workplace. Uh, but very few companies have uh, similar targets in the supply chain uh, and, and tracking progress on meeting some of those targets. So I think there's definitely uh, the initial steps of uh, ensuring gender equality by having these targets is there, but a lot more needs to be done because a lot of the issues actually are in the supply chain, particularly in the food sector. So, so there's a lot of ground to cover uh, in, in that sense. Uh, and then, uh, uh, violence, harassment, uh, retaliation on uh, uh, women and other members, uh, and, and especially against uh, women members who are part of trade unions and uh, are, are bringing up issues. Uh, it requires a, a, a safe environment for them to be uh, bringing up those voices and sharing their concerns. Uh, so there is a big gap there. Uh, about 30% of the companies prohibit uh, this kind of intimidation and harassment. So I think that is definitely an area of concern uh, where companies need to step up. Uh, and then uh, the Hershey company in the food and ag sector was the best performing company in the sector. But even with that, the overall score was uh, less than 50 points, uh, uh, but it was higher than the comparative average score of 21 points uh, in the agriculture sector. So for us, uh, presenting the data and the evidence is just one part and the first step of identifying where these issues are. Uh, and also basis of the feedback that we get from companies that we assess. Uh, many companies uh, use this as a roadmap or try to see where their gaps are, how are they performing as compared to their own peers. Uh, uh, so it helps them to uh, have uh, a roadmap, a plan of action in place to address 
these gaps that have been identified. Uh, in some cases, we've also seen, uh, for example, a corporate human rights benchmark, which we have been publishing uh, for several years now. Um, performance on some of these benchmarks have also been linked with executive compensation and pay. We work a lot with uh, investors uh, who use our data to engage with companies uh, to accelerate some of these actions that companies take. Uh, similarly, um, in the policy space, uh, we work with uh, our, our allies and policymakers uh, who identify where are the market failures, where are the gaps that exist, uh, perhaps where policy can step up and address uh, some of those gaps. Uh, what we do after publishing these results uh, is uh, create a group of uh, stakeholders, uh, which include civil society organizations, business platforms, uh, investors, academics, and policymakers to come together and identify what collective action we can take to help companies, to engage companies to improve their performance. We also create uh, a safe space for companies that we are assessing to come together and learn from each other. And we have had several such uh, sessions where companies talk about the challenges in implementing some of these policies and they can ask questions from each other uh, of how they were able to get the internal buy-in or what kind of challenges they faced uh, in implementing a certain policy and how did they overcome some of this. So that's a community of practice that we have. Uh, and then in July this year, we will be publishing uh, a social benchmark uh, which will look at all 2000 companies in the scope of WBA. <clears throat> and we are assessing them on uh, high level societal expectations on decent work on human rights and ethical action. Uh, all our resources are publicly available, uh, the insights, the rankings, the data and the methodology, everything is available on the website. So if any of you are interested in using that, if you find difficulty in accessing that, feel free to reach out to us and we'll be more than happy to uh, help you and guide you to uh, any of the resources that you want to access. So, so I think that's uh, all from my presentation. So you can write to us on, on this email. I can also share my own email in chat. Uh, so if you want to reach uh, out to us. And I see Thank there are some much, questions. Man. Thank you very much for your very insightful presentation indeed. Yeah. And um, just to uh, briefly share the points that I would be um, taking with me out of your presentation. Uh, let's start by the positive one. I think that business have a special role to play in leading social transformation, right? I think that's that's one of the conclusion, but there's still progress to be made and we need more than good at intentions. Uh, I get that many companies uh, in your benchmark, they have targets, they have policy established, but then they failed measuring the impact, the progress, or also to look into what is really happening in the supply chain. And maybe that's what we really need to be uh, looking at in the future. Um, so now it's time for questions. Uh, so I'm sure uh, there will be many questions coming in the chat uh, function of uh, of Zoom today. There are already, uh, we already have a few questions. Uh, the first one for you, uh, Namit, you mentioned, I think it was at the beginning of your presentation in the key insights about three companies that had achieved uh, gender balance at leadership level. And the question was uh, whether you could share with us where they were from, where, where these are located. Sure. Um, I, I don't have the names of the companies uh with me yet, uh, but um, I, I think um, the three companies uh, which are actually publishing uh, data by leadership level uh, across their supply chain in the apparel sector were um, BF Corporation, Gap, and H&M. Uh, and I think what we have found is uh, there was no clear regional representation. It was not that a con companies from a certain region or a country are performing better than other country. I think there is quite a lot of similarity when it comes to who are the good performers, but also companies that are not uh, performing well. So we did not find that a certain region was doing better than uh, other regions. Okay, thank you very much for sharing. I think that's a, a good conclusion. So, uh, so we cannot say that we are safe in this part of the world and all the issues are somewhere else, right? Uh, Everyone has to do their share and uh, have an honest look at their supply chains and 
be proactive in the way they approach due diligence. Um, uh, I have um, some more questions for you, if that's okay. We still have time for that. And don't hesitate to share uh, more, more, more questions if you have any in the chat. Uh, one of these questions is about peer pressure. Do you think that peer pressure lead to more actions from companies? So I think uh, for us, um, it's it's not about peer pressure, but I think more about learning and sharing from each other. Because what we have seen is when we assess companies, each and every company has at least one thing that others can learn from. So I think uh, it, it's about um, creating that safe space where they can see what others are doing uh, and, and what they can learn from each other uh, and helping each other. So. Uh, I know it, it works quite uh, uh, easy to see that uh, companies get into a competitive space and try to outperform others. Uh, but whenever we bring companies together and they start talking about the challenges that they face, I think there is more similarity than dissimilarity uh, within companies. And I think that is where the energy is and that is where we want to, what we want to leverage and, and work with companies rather than having a competition because that oftentimes is not very productive because these are systemic changes. So if a bunch of companies are doing better than the rest, uh, it is not going to change uh, the overall system that we are in. Thank you. I have an extra question for you. It's about parental leave. Uh, and the question is how you feel when it will be implemented globally? Any guess? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, and, and Giving a bit of a context, and um, many a times when uh, we reached out to companies, companies came back and said that, oh, we are following a certain legislation at the country level, uh, and different countries have different expectations when it comes to maternity leave, paternity leave. Uh, and I think what we uh, try to urge and, and tell companies is that uh, companies have a lot of influence uh, in also sending market signals uh, to governments. Uh, so if companies can come together and say that, okay, this is the level of paternity leave and maternity leave that we are going to offer to our employees, that gives a very strong signal to all the other um, companies in that economy uh, as well. It gives a strong signal to government that yes, there is an opportunity, there is a gap for us to step in and have a threshold uh, so that companies can uh, meet that. So, so it's more about the leadership role that companies can have uh, in stepping up uh, where they have an influence, uh, where there is a gap and policies don't exist. Uh, it's obviously not easy. It's easier said than done. But I think um, some companies have shown that uh, they uh, take those steps, engage uh, at different levels uh, through their trade uh, bodies, through uh, advocacy groups to make sure that there is at least some level of parity uh, when it comes. And it has happened in other issues uh, when it comes to health and safety uh, uh, issues where companies have stepped up and helped governments to also have a um, you know a level playing field uh, in setting standards. So I'm quite positive that it's also possible with uh, uh, paternity and, and maternity leaves uh, and many other issues, including representation and pay gap as well. Thank you, Namit. Uh, another question for you um, from Sally Smith. Are you seeing more companies willing to engage with you on their gender assessments over time? Uh, and does willingness to engage vary by sector? And is there more or less willingness to engage on gender than on other topics that uh, you work on? Yeah, so for us, the gender benchmark uh, is relatively new. We did a small pilot a couple of years ago. So this is uh, the first gender benchmark at scale. Uh, but many of these companies are also assessed in other benchmarks. Uh, and, and what we have seen is uh, over the years, uh, companies uh, engage more. They understand where we are coming from. And there's definitely, uh, as we go forward, we see more engagement uh, from companies. But interestingly, um, uh, many of the food companies who are assessed in our food and agriculture benchmark uh, have been demanding that uh, there is a gender benchmark coming from WBA mm -hmm. so that they can have internal buy-in so these are people in sustainability departments who, who tell us that if WBA puts a spotlight on gender, we will get more internal buy-in to work on some of the gender policies as well. There have been companies who are not part of our uh, sample size uh, who came and said that, how can we be included in uh, 
um, the benchmark and how can we also share uh, some of our data. So there's definitely a lot of interest among companies, particularly on gender. Uh, and, and there are various reasons. Some companies feel that they have better policies and they want to be assessed. Uh, and others feel that if there is a spotlight on us, uh, we will get more buy-in and we will be able to get things done as well. Great, thank you. Um, I think you have inspired uh, several people to do better because there are some questions in the chat about front runners and how to become one. And uh, one question is about uh, the most impactful action a company could take, because we've seen that some companies stand out. So um, do you know why is that? Is it because there was a CEO commitment, uh, because they started their journey earlier than others, or because they had bad press and they just were reacting to, to what was happening? Sure, and I think uh, what I also had in the slides is uh, the top 100 companies that outperformed their peers. Uh, we, we saw uh, two two areas where they have done really well. Uh, one is definitely having a public commitment from the top. Uh, so yes, if there is signal from the top that they believe in a certain uh, ideology and, and agenda, then it's easier to get everything uh, in, in motion. So if the CEO and the board agrees on uh, prioritizing gender equality, then I think it's always easier to get things uh, done. And then we found that uh, companies uh, who are doing better are also taking steps to address the issue of unpaid care work, uh, because I think that's a very big issue that has not been acknowledged enough uh, in uh, the economic spaces. And I think that is quite a big game changer in making sure that women are able to uh, participate more in economic activity and uh, it, it's not an invisible uh, issue, but more visible, something that uh, people can talk about and, and address. Thank you. There is one more question around uh, parental leave. Uh, and it's about how we can change the conversation um, from describing parental leave as a cost to an investment. Absolutely. And I think... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, a couple of days ago, World Bank also published uh, this report highlighting the status of women. Um, in, in, uh, it was also quite dismal to see that uh, there is a huge gap. But they also said that if uh, women are able to uh, achieve uh, the desired participation in economic activity, that could result in uh, an increase in GDP by, I think, uh, 15 or 20 percent. So I think that's the kind of uh, economic value that we are talking about. But again, we don't need to uh, bring in business case or economic value to suggest why women should be uh, uh, becoming more part of uh, the economic uh, spaces. Um, and it is very much about companies who, who are able to see the value of making sure that uh, issues around uh, family and, and unpaid care work is understood more widely. It's not about uh, creating those structures where uh, uh, parental leave is only given to some kind of employees, not in other regions, given to uh, only women and not uh, uh, men, for example. So I think those are some of the steps that creates that opportunity for companies to make sure that any hurdles that are there for women to participate more openly in, in the uh, companies, in the supply chain can be addressed. Uh, so it is definitely... Uh, a good investment to make, uh, but we always try to say that it's it's not about the business case, but this is the right thing to do, and therefore companies should be looking at it. Yes, actually, I was reading a few articles about this this week, and there is a debate within the community on whether we should still be discussing the business case because that's what gets business going and and drive change, or if, as you stage, I mean, there was no. Uh, I mean, that should be a moral imperative. That's just how it should be. So, uh, I mean, articulating the business case is maybe not the right approach when it comes to uh, promoting gender equality. There is one uh, more question um, in the chat. Uh, so currently the gender benchmark uh, assess is, is more about women empowerment, uh, but truly it hampers from freshers that are at masculine gender. Are you really looking over it or believe into it? Not sure if I completely understand the question, but maybe let me try and uh, address that. So uh, one is, I mean, we are looking at the gender binary. Uh, we 
in in the back end we collect data on non binary as well uh, but i think uh, it will take us some time to also see where companies are and then look at the non binary genders as well so beyond the male female and and where companies are uh, because the data is available on the binary that is where uh, our lens is and we look at uh, men and women but also uh, for example if you look at our representation indicator uh, we we are looking at a range of 40 to 60% uh, and there have been instances where companies come and say that uh, you know we have 70% uh, representation of of women uh, and and uh, we don't give them a higher score just because uh, they have more than the prescribed uh, limit uh, because it's about a balance uh, so that balance is equally important uh, for for our uh, methodology and from the international standards that we follow because often uh, either uh, there will be large number of women in a certain level in the leadership uh, and less in a, a different level uh, and then uh, there are also uh, you know cons of having uh, a large number of women across the board uh, because that defeats the purpose of a gender balance and gender equality so so i think that is how we try to make sure that we are not looking at uh, any of these biases at the moment but yes at the moment we are only looking at the gender binary but at the back end we are uh, looking at data of what companies are publishing uh, about uh, the non binary but that's very limited at the moment okay thank you uh, two more questions uh, because we are approaching the end of our webinar first question is around the CSRD uh, the corporate um, sustainability reporting directive um Do you think that it will have an impact in assessing um, gender-related inequalities within the company and the supply chain? Absolutely, and I think uh, it it should. I think more uh, we see regional or global standards that promote uh, transparency. That's always uh, a welcome move because in many cases companies don't don't know or haven't seen what the supply chain is looking like. So the more transparency that comes out, many of these issues. Uh, whether it's gender inequality or other forms of inequality will come out and therefore uh, we will be able to address some of those uh, challenges uh, going forward so csrd or others uh, you know legislations coming out uh, they are always uh, helpful to create more transparency thank you so the last question now uh, and maybe it's for um, our own interest uh, so maybe um, you could uh, um Give us uh, share with us our uh, your your check about Amphory and how we can step up uh, in driving uh, gender equality further. Absolutely, and I think uh, uh, like I mentioned, uh, our objective is to use the findings and the methodology as a roadmap. Uh, and I'm sure many of the companies that we have assessed are also your members, uh, so they will obviously be in a better place to see where they perform. Uh, but the methodology is open the data is out there so uh, i think uh, if companies want to see where they are uh, they can use the methodology if they want to see how companies in their own sector are performing uh, what are those gaps uh, that data is also available if any company wants to uh, understand from us more deeper in terms of what they can do i think we'll be happy to work with them for you and organize or, or participate in sessions uh, to go more deeper on some of those issues so, so i think it's about awareness and creating uh, an understanding of uh, what what we can do together like you said linda i think it, it's about a co collaborative approach we cannot do it alone uh, so therefore uh, we are always ready to collaborating and partnering with others very good thank you that meet that was our final uh, question for today so uh, we're reaching the end of these webinars uh, i would want to uh, to say a few words to, 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 to conclude this webinar we had together. So first by thanking Namit again for, for, for participating and sharing these insights with us. Very, uh, very um, appreciated indeed. Um, so today, as you know, uh, we are celebrating the International Women's Day. It has become like something recurring, more like a custom uh, to do it. Uh, and personally, my check is that I would want every day to be dedicated to the celebration of womanhood. But maybe that will sound a bit unfair to our uh, uh, men colleagues. Uh, so uh, maybe not. 
But why do we need to uh, to to still celebrate this day? It's indeed because we are not there yet, and that was clearly demonstrated through your presentation, Namit, uh, that the road is still long, and is it's it is still a useful reminder to state that human rights are also women's rights. Uh, important to to remind uh, a message to to keep in mind. So. Uh, Linda, you mentioned that there are uh, about 190 million women uh, working in global supply chains. So uh, as a natural conclusion, uh, it's very clear that gender is a parameter that cannot be ignored when setting up your business due diligence policy. Um, at the same time, uh, the root causes of um, discrimination are, and inequality are very complex. They are all intertwined and not easy to tackle. So it's not that straightforward. Uh, but as it is often the case when with anything in the due diligence landscape, it requires uh, time and efforts to tackle this. And it also requires collaboration. Another uh, buzzword that you mentioned, uh, Linda, and it requires collaboration across different actors, uh, across different forums, if we want to move the needle in the right direction. Um, leveraging um, governments and business purchasing powers is really critical. It, it, it's, it's a critical part of the solution to achieve gender equality and to empower women in supply chains. So it is for this very reason that uh, Alfari has decided to actively contribute to the B20 um, discussions and join the Business Council on Women, Diversity and Inclusion. And at the same time, also to um, amplify our impact, we will continue collaborating with the various actors and partners to advance gender equality in supply chain. So, of course, uh, as the head of advocacy and engagement, I have to believe that entering into these conversations can drive positive change, and I do. But I'm also aware that to drive impact on the ground, you also need to involve actors on the ground and policies just policies by themselves will not drive meaningful change. It takes uh, the joint commitment of management and workers in factories to also implement this. So Linda explained a bit our approach earlier, the Amphori approach, and we will continue our efforts to better equip our members to with tools and products that enable them to carry out gender responsive due diligence. And uh, in that effort, building capacity remains uh, crucial. And last year, uh, on that very day, uh, we celebrated the 8th of March by launching our um, members training on gender responsive due diligence. Uh, this year, I'm pleased to announce that there will be more trainings coming. Uh, there will be one on discrimination and harassment at work, uh, and also another one on how to build gender responsible, uh, gender responsive social management system. So um, stay tuned. Uh, this 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 will come, and uh, um, I'm gonna conclude uh, this webinar a bit in advance. So I'm I'm this the gift of time, right, uh, for this celebration. And I thank you again for your participation, for the question we received, and I wish you a very nice day and a nice weekend ahead. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Everyone. Bye. Bye.